Okay, we have a good number now, so I think we can start. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Guy Vesey. I'm the director of the Hermitage Foundation UK, and I joined a little over a year ago. Uh, and it's been an incredibly interesting year to join the foundation. Uh, looking at the attendees today, I'm extremely pleased to see so many familiar names. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining today. Uh, and of course, uh, many of our friends and patrons and our corporate partners are here, uh, as well as our trustees. And the, the friends, patrons and corporate partners, I'd like to, to thank you especially for, for your support over the last year. Uh, Janice is going to speak uh, a little bit more about this, but uh, I really wanted to say that uh, it's, it's not been a normal year and we are extremely grateful that you have continued to support us uh, with your memberships. And for those that are new, please do check out our brand new website. Uh, one of the, the silver linings of COVID has meant time to, to create a new website where you can find out all about our work, what we do to support the State Hermitage Museum. Uh, and if you're interested uh, and are able to do so, to become a friend uh, and, uh, or, and or a patron. Um, and you can find out all of the details online about what, that's, what, that, what that offers to you. So it's been a really busy year, despite the pandemic, despite everything. We have managed to build, as I mentioned, a new website, hermitagefoundation.co.uk. We've got a refreshed Instagram account with all sorts of new campaigns um, and a new YouTube channel, uh, which is brand new. We've got uh, over 30 new videos, uh, videos about the, the collection of, of St. Petersburg, uh, the, the incredible 3.2 million object collection. So you can imagine with 30 videos done, we could be creating videos for a long time, and we hope that we are. Uh, but this is all new content in English, um, and it's, it's, it's really opening up the collection uh, and making it more accessible uh, to people across the world, which is, of course, a, a key part of what we do. But in working on that digital content, we've, we've, we've been contacted and, in, and, and been engaging with um, a younger audience, which, which has been fantastic. And as a result, we're now um, happy to, to announce that we're about to set up a new group of friends, the Young Friends of the Hermitage Foundation UK. Uh, and the first virtual meeting of this group will take place in a couple of weeks time. And if you're interested, if you're over 18, uh, interested in art, architecture, Russia, culture, um, then, then, or you know somebody that is, then please do, uh, do visit our website, sign up on the Join Us page uh, and, and join this meeting. It's, it's completely free to join. Uh, we want the, the group to be as accessible as possible, uh, as diverse as possible. Uh, and we really think that the group that we already have signed up, uh, 30 plus people, it's a, it's a fantastic group, really, really engaged, enthusiastic people. Uh, and I know that, um, that that's going to be a lot of fun uh, to be a part of. So please do spread the word about that. So today's talk, I'm not going to talk for much longer, I promise. Uh, today's talk is um, The Absinthe Drinker by Picasso. Uh, an, an incredible work from his blue period in the State Hermitage Museum. The talks by Chris Riopel uh, from the National Gallery in London. Uh, his, his portion is, is pre-recorded, um, but you know, he's not just a great curator, he's an incredible speaker. Uh, you're going to learn a lot, you'll hopefully enjoy it, enjoy it too. Um, but uh, so we won't, uh, we won't have questions and answers with, with Chris, but uh, Janice and I are here and we want to to try and answer any questions you have um, on, on the foundation. Uh, you can ask questions uh, about the talk and if we can answer, then we will. Uh, and if, if you really are burning for an answer, then we will do our best to get those to you after the talk. Um, so an absinthe drinker that got us thinking, you know, people have been experimenting with cocktails all through lockdown. So we, we spoke to a friend of the foundation, Alessandro Palazzi, uh, who to my mind is the best martini maker in the world. Uh, he's at the Duke's Bar in St. James's. For anyone that's not been, highly recommend it. Uh, it's where Ian Fleming uh, famously used to sit and, and write his Bond novels and where he supposedly came up with his Vespa martini uh, a little bit before Alessandro's time, uh, but he, he, he manages an incredible bar there. Alessandro has a strong following on Instagram um, and does a lot of work uh, for charity, uh, for the hospitality sector. So please do check him out. Uh, and you'll be able to watch the video of uh, him making this cocktail on our YouTube page. Um, 
So with your absinthe cocktail in hand, uh, it didn't really feel appropriate for me to be drinking absinthe while talking to you, uh, but I know that some of you on the video have managed to prepare the cocktail. Um, so with your, with your drink in hand, um, I'm going to pass over to Janice Saka, my wonderful colleague, who's going to talk very briefly um, about the, the friends and patrons and the events we've got coming up. And then we're going to get to, to hear from Chris. So thank you very much for joining. I hope you enjoy the talk, the first of many. Janice, over to you. Thank you, Guy. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I have missed seeing you this past year when I have been unable to arrange the normal live events and private visits to museums, but hope you have enjoyed the online events we were able to arrange and the digital content which Guy has created and just mentioned. For those of us or all of us who were unable to visit Russia this past year, I hope you have enjoyed the virtual tour of the Hermitage Museum when you can walk through the museum at your own pace and see all the works of art on display there, from antiquity to the current day. I want to thank the friends and patrons of the Hermitage Foundation UK today for your continued support and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the forthcoming events we will be able to arrange post the 17th of May. Some of you may know that the Cecil Beaton exhibition celebrating celebrity, which recently closed in St. Petersburg, is coming to the UK and will open at Blenheim Palace on the 17th of May. I will be arranging a private visit to Blenheim for our members, as well as to many forthcoming exhibitions where there will be works of art on display from the Hermitage Museum. These include Epic Iran at the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Tercentenary Exhibition of Grinling Gibbons opening at Bonhams and then travelling to Compton Burney, the Fabergé Exhibition of the Victoria and Albert Exhibition, and a Raphael Exhibition at the National Gallery, which was postponed last year due to COVID. We will also be visiting the Royal Academy and David Hockney's new exhibition, The Arrival of Spring, which we will then take to St Petersburg and opening at the Hermitage Museum in 2022 the first time David's work has been on display in Russia. But now to today and an absinthe with Picasso. I hope you've been able to make the cocktail that Alessandro Palazzi created especially for us for today. Thank you, Alessandro. It is my great pleasure to introduce Chris Riopol, the Neil Westreet curator of post-1800 paintings at the National Gallery. Previously, Chris held curatorial positions at the J. Paul Getty Museum and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. You will have read the impressive list of exhibitions and publications Chris has made in the invitation to this event today. I had the privilege of being invited to help arrange the National Gallery Patrons Tour to St. Petersburg in 2019 and was so was lucky to tour the amazing collection of the 19th, 20th and 21st century objects in the General Staff Building of the Hermitage Museum with Chris as our guide. There amongst the amazing collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings are over 30 works by Pablo Picasso. Today, Chris is going to talk to us about just one of them, the absinthe drinker, Chris. Thank you, Janice. Let me. Thank you very much. One of the uh, pictures that I find particularly beautifully installed in the General Staff Building, now that it has become the home of the modern pictures at the Hermitage is this mysterious, compelling work by Picasso of 1901, his absinthe drinker, uh, showing a woman seated in the corner of a cafe. It's a, a kind of public space, drawn together her arms around her. She's not at the moment drinking. She seems to be lost in a kind of uh, reverie, quite alone, quite melancholic. Um, it is a picture I want to look at 
today in, in terms of where it stands in Picasso's career, and it comes at a very vital moment, as we will see, where it stands in the development of what turns out to be a very important theme for artists, particularly in Paris, uh, in the years around 1900, that is drinking, but specifically the drinking of uh, absinthe. Look at it in the history of Russian collecting of, uh, of contemporary art, and then ask a few questions about what it, uh, it tells us uh, about Picasso. The, the theme of absinthe drinking begins rather spectacularly uh, with this picture by Edgar Degas of the middle 1870s. Uh, the drink, it's made of bitter wormwood. It famously was extremely strong, uh, could put its drinkers into a kind of reverie, a kind of a state of absence. One of the factors you will see in many of the images we're going to look at is that there is very little communication uh, among the people who are drinking this strong drink. Uh, they may be sitting beside one another, but their minds seem to be elsewhere. And the drink was famous uh, for that, famous for carrying the drinker far, far uh, away. Uh, there was one version made with cognac uh, that Toulouse-Lautrec uh, came to call the tremblement de terre, the earthquake. Uh, so powerfully did it take over the, uh, the drinker's body and mind. But as I say, uh, the theme of the drinking of absinthe in cafes uh, really begins with this painting by Degas. He planned to show it in Paris in 1876, but did not. And it's very interesting to speculate, did he worry that it might be a controversial picture as indeed it would turn out to be? Uh, because instead, in that year, 76, he sends it to England, where it must be among the very first Degas to be bought in uh, this country. It is, it is acquired by a man named Henry Hill, who shows it once during his lifetime, uh, where it already begins to arouse criticism, not for the painting, not the, the Impressionist style was a little new, for uh, British audiences, but it was really the subject matter that right from the first time it was shown began to raise questions about um, modern painting. What, how can it show such debased subject matter uh, as this? People lost in drink. In fact, they're, they're two friends of, um, of Dugas, whom Dugas has asked to pose for him, Hélène André, a woman who often modeled for him, that the painter Marcelin uh, Desboutins, another old friend, he, he's posed them here. Uh, but again, the lack of communication between them, the sense that they are far gone uh, in drink, suggested to many English viewers uh, that this was an image of a society that had been debased. That certainly became true in uh, 1893. Hill dies and his collection, uh, uh, including several modern French pictures, uh, comes on the market, comes for sale. And it is at that point in the mid 1890s that a huge scandal erupts in this country uh, about this painting of absinthe. Uh, drinkers, the Westminster Magazine in particular, uh, launches this campaign week after week about uh, the debasement of society that art could depict such things. It seems that since Napoleon planned his invasion, the perfidy of the French had never been more um, uh, uh, clear to the sturdy English uh, than, than uh, this image of Parisian uh, decadence. So the, the painting and the subject matter particularly uh, were famous uh, from that moment. Uh, and by that time, many other French painters had taken it up as well. Uh, here you see Raffaelli, a work recently acquired in San Francisco, his absinthe drinkers, uh, two men, uh, again, the, the, the brilliant color here and more yellow, other places uh, green, other places still a kind of blue, but a lurid color always. 
Uh, here they are at a tavern on the edge of town, drinking it, not communicating, lost in their own thoughts. And you notice this, the um, subtitle that Raffaelli gave to his painting, Les Déclassés, the people outside of the structures of society, living on the edge, the marginals, already in the 1880s, uh, that notion that it was marginalized people, and as we'll see, uh, actors, prostitutes, artists in particular, came, became associated with the drinking of, uh, of absinthe. That certainly was something that Toulouse-Lautrec uh, took up uh, when he depicted his friend, uh, Vincent van Gogh. They were students together at the Atelier Cormont in Paris uh, in 1887. 1887 when he painted this image of him, we, we recognize Vincent's very distinctive Dutch profile uh, in, the, uh, in this pastel uh, and the glass of absinthe in front of him. And indeed, we know that, um, we know that uh, Vincent did enjoy absinthe particularly. Uh, but what you see here, very clever in Toulouse-Lautrec's visual imagination, is the way in which he takes the lurid color of the drink, that uh, spectrum from yellow into green into blue, and carries it all over across the canvas so that it becomes uh, a kind of milieu, an atmosphere uh, that pervades the image in which he situates his, um, his friend uh, Vincent. Uh, so that uh, uh, imagery of excess, that imagery of it being dealing with a, a, the margins of society was becoming ever and ever stronger in images like these. And he, here in this uh, remarkable Toulouse-Lautrec from Chicago at the Moulin Rouge, uh, he does not show absinthe itself, but in the woman on the right caught in gaslight, her face has taken on uh, the green tonalities of absinthe itself, so that anyone in Paris in the 1890s aware of the Moulin Rouge, aware of that uh, 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 Montmartre lifestyle of the marginalized would recognize that we're seeing the atmosphere of, um, of absinthe and absinthe drinking in this woman's uh, face. And indeed, that is a, a, an illusion between absinthe and its lurid colors that would be very strong. Uh, I show you from the very end of the century, uh, Lenoir's Reverie, the dream, an artist, we know he's an artist from the, uh, from the loose tie he's wearing, and his mistress and model <laughs> here now in an image saturated uh, with the blue green of, uh, of absinthe. Uh, and that it has come to be recognized in that context. Uh, I show you the catalog of the great exhibition of 2012 in Paris on La Vie de Bohème, on the way uh, Bohemians lived, in which that lurid color has become the very color of Bohemian life uh, itself. This is the context in which uh, uh, Picasso takes up uh, the, the subject of absinthe drinking uh, in his painting. He visits Paris as an 18 year old for the first time in uh, 1900. He's there to see the Universal Exposition and the great exhibitions of world painting uh, on at that time. This photograph is taken sometime uh, around then, maybe 1900, 1901, 1902 perhaps. Uh, and then he's dedicating it here to someone in 1904. Um, we recognize his features, we recognize his artist's loose uh, tie, and we recognize, uh, of course, most famously, the eyes of Picasso that look with such intensity uh, at everything and for which he, was, he would become so famous. Now in Paris, in uh, uh, 1900, Picasso scores quite a coup in that he is offered an exhibition uh, at his gallery by Ambrose Vollard, the most important avant-garde uh, art dealer in Paris at the time, the Jay Joplin of, of Paris at that moment, the man who in 1896 had given 
Um, Cezanne, his first one-man show, uh, had taken up Gauguin very uh, strongly and other avant-garde artists to be offered a show and by this point uh, turning about to turn 19 and already offered an exhibition by Volard. Uh, it was an extraordinary uh, moment of early success for Picasso, but it was a, a, a situation in which he had to do a lot of work. So he goes back to Barcelona to prepare for the exhibition. He He's going to fill uh, Volard's space with pictures. And so he turns out within the next several months before coming back to Paris, some 60 uh, pictures. And it's there, perhaps begun in Barcelona, perhaps uh, in Paris, perhaps begun in Barcelona, finished in Paris, uh, a whole uh, series of pictures, in, such as the one on the left here, in which he introduces this theme already so closely associated with the Parisian uh, uh, underworld, the Parisian bohemian world, uh, as in uh, this work of 1901 from a private collection, which would indeed be shown in that Volar exhibition. And you know, see his new first Parisian style emerging very nervous, uh, very angular, brilliant colors in this woman with the fantastic, um, fantastic hands. Um, hovering above the green glass of absinthe, uh, the sense of um, animation that he gives to his very brush strokes, even as she seems to uh, be off in a uh, in a reverie. It is this kind of work that Picasso would show at uh, Volars, um, and I just show you then from uh, fifteen years later. He's still dealing with the theme as having moved on to uh, his uh, Cubist period, uh, here his famous um, glass of absinthe in bronze from the Metropolitan, the, the uh, piece of sugar sitting on top. Even that long later, he's still working through uh, the themes of, um, of absinthe drinking in every uh, medium that he's working in. Now, the 1901 exhibition Chez Volant is a great success. Um, from that moment, Picasso, who would, of course, uh, within a few decades become the most famous artist in the world, that huge fame of Picasso really arises from that moment. From that moment, he's recognized uh, as the most important young artist in Paris, the one everyone was watching. And it is in this context that he pays, play, that he paints the Hermitage uh, picture, not before the Volar exhibition, but afterwards, in the very busy autumn of um, 1901, when he is reveling in the success of the uh, Volar exhibition, but is also dealing with the suicide of his dear friend, Casajemus, a uh, man with whom he was very close, who killed himself for love of his mistress. Um, Picasso was undone by it. And the post Volar exhibition uh, style emerges very much in the autumn of 1901 in pictures like this, most notably, and for some reason he associated it with Casajemus, most notably in the growing use of the color blue. And we're heading into uh, what would be called um, the blue period. And you see it dominates uh, this picture, uh, this image now highly stylized, simplified uh, in a sense. It's not that br nervous brush stroke anymore. It is this uh, use of big blocks of pure color, uh, the enclosure of forms such as this woman into herself, if you will, the way her hands wrap around her and basically turn her into quite a pure egg shaped uh, form, the blue bottle of uh, the seltzer in front of her, and then the glass in which the absinthe would be, uh, the wonderful abstraction of the mirror behind the woman, we don't know what it is uh, that is reflected, but it is a, a, a patterns of blue and red and yellow, very vivid, uh, very, uh, very strong. Uh, this would mark the next year and a half or so really of, um, of uh, Picasso's work. 
Uh, and in 1911, Sergei Shukin coming to Paris on his many trips, buying modern art, uh, becomes more and more fascinated with Picasso. And he buys this picture in 1911 from Kahnweiler, another of the most important of the um, uh, contemporary dealers who has sort of taken over from Volar as Picasso's principal uh, dealer at this time. And the picture comes back then to Russia, uh, originally to, uh, to Moscow. Absinthe seems not to have been known or to have been very little known in, um, in Russia at that time. And so uh, the picture originally in the Shukin collection uh, was not called the Absinthe Drinker, but simply the Drunkard which is not as, uh, as good a title, dare I say, uh, because it's implying a judgment about her, uh, a judgment that she has been excessive in her drink. Whereas Picasso himself is not saying that. She, she is lost in thought, uh, to be sure, but she looks to me to be entirely uh, complis mentis if she is thinking deep thoughts, but they are her own thoughts and she is in, in control. Now, he continues at that point uh, to, <coughs> in, in later 1901 and into 1902, to paint uh, images of absinthe drinkers, increasingly showing them in relation to theatrical types. The man here is a harlequin, uh, so a circus figure, again, a marginal in society. And his companion, that sense of failure of communication certainly continues as he turns one way, she turns the, uh, the other, their bodies are closely intermingled, but uh, the sense of um, enjoying one another's company is not there. Now, interestingly, this uh, painting is acquired not by Shukin, but by his, if you will, major competitor as a collector of contemporary French art, Morisov. And of course, it shows the, if you will, the equity with which uh, in Soviet Russia, the two collections were divided between Moscow and St. Petersburg um, in that St. Petersburg gets one absinthe drinker by Picasso, Moscow very carefully gets another absinthe drinker uh, by, uh, by Picasso. And that indeed seems to have been a very careful um, planning on that part at that moment of division that, uh, that both cities uh, be able to show the artists, the modern artists in, uh, in depth and in some ways in the, uh, in the same way. Uh, the uh, Hermitage picture is most often compared with this work, which is, uh, went uh, very relatively early uh, to New York. It's now in the Metropolitan, the seated Harlequin. It's not quite clear what he's uh, looking uh, but again, it is the same, the whitened face is, is marvelous here, but that sense of um, in the cafe being lost in one's own thoughts, in inhabiting uh, one's own world, that melancholia that uh, uh, pervades uh, the works of the, of the, the post-Volar exhibition uh, of uh, 1901, um, as he mourned Casa Jamis and that only slowly would he come out of. So this is the context uh, in which the uh, absinthe drinker in uh, St. Petersburg uh, was, uh, was painted, uh, central to the development of Picasso's art at a very vital moment. But if I at the end can digress a bit, it is a very helpful picture for me as a curator in thinking about curatorial <coughs> issues like the dating of uh, pictures. And so I'm contrasting as I've done for myself a number of times, uh, the absinthe drinker with this picture on the left called Maternity, Motherhood uh, by, uh, by Picasso. Uh, this is a picture that descended in, in uh, came fairly early to America and descended in American collections uh, always dated 1903, the picture on the left now in a private collection and on loan to the National Gallery, um, always dated 1903 until in 1957, it was shown, uh, it was uh, went up for auction at Park Burnett in New York, 
subsequently taken over by uh, Sotheby's. And it sold in 1957 for the astronomical sum of $125,000. So unbelievable was a it was that price of $125,000 in 1957 that it made the front page of the New York Times. Picasso painting of 1903 reaches $125,000. Picasso, who of course loved money and kept close track of these things, uh, saw the story, of course, and he goes to Zervos, the man responsible for um, keeping track of all his paintings. And in 57, Picasso says to Zervos, no, they're wrong. This is not 1903. This is 1901. That is the exact same uh, date as the absinthe drinker in uh, St. Petersburg. And so from that moment on, this painting, because Picasso must be right, that painting has always been uh, dated 1901. And I think you can, it, it, the, the signature at lower right is later, and we know that he kept the picture for several years and probably only signed it when he sold it in, say, 1910. Uh, but chose not to put the, any date on it at that time. You can see the connection with the absinthe drinker, that way in which the mother and child have been turned into an egg shape, just like the absinthe drinker herself. You can see the similarity in the hands as they wrap around the, uh, the uh, figures. Uh, you can see the uh, certain linearities in the depiction of the face that tie them, of, of both the mother and child, uh, that tie it together. And yet there are equally striking differences. Uh, the opening up of space, the complexity of the landscape in which uh, these sitters, um, uh, uh, these figures uh, sit, the unfinished quality, very unlike the quality of uh, the absinthe drinker, where the entire surface is filled with blocks of, uh, of color. Uh, the reference in the background to, um, to uh, works by Gauguin. And interestingly, uh, Picasso, who never met Gauguin, would have learned in 1903 that he had died in Tahiti. And there was a great revival of interest in 1903 uh, to um, uh, to uh, Gauguin that uh, at that moment elsewhere we see uh, Picasso picking up on. So I think it's very interesting for me and for, for all of us to think about this question, looking, comparing the St. Petersburg uh, picture with the one on loan to the National Gallery uh, and ask the uh, question, could Picasso himself have been wrong? Is it 1901 or is it 1903? And I think it's one of the fascinations of the absinthe drinker that it is so key to figuring out so many things in Picasso's early career. So I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for for, for sticking with us. Uh, I'm sure that I'm sure that everybody is now lost in a world of Picasso, uh, and those that have enjoyed the absinthe cocktail probably a little bit more lost than the rest of us. Um, but thank you. It was uh, it was a fascinating talk, and we will of course pass on our thanks to Chris uh, for for a really excellent talk. So we don't have any um, uh, questions coming through, which is understandable that. Chris has is, is not been able to join us for the Q&A. But uh, I did just want to remind everyone about a couple of things while I have everybody's attention, uh, just to remind you about the young friends. Uh, so if you uh, know of someone that could be interested uh, or you are interested yourself, and I know that um, a lot of our, our, our young friends are here today, uh, thank you for coming. Um, please do encourage people to go to our website, uh, to the Join Us page uh, where they can sign up. Uh, and for those that are uh, not friends or patrons of, of the Hermitage Foundation UK, 
and are interested in, in joining us, please, again, visit our website. Uh, you can get all the details there. Um, and yeah, social media, um, please do follow us. Uh, we'd love to break that thousand follower mark on Instagram. Um, we would love to have more followers on, on YouTube. Uh, you, can, you can find all of our details again on the website. Uh, so please do head across there. Um, so for those that I've not met, I, would, I look forward to meeting you all, uh, perhaps at uh, Blenheim Palace uh, for the Cecil Beaton exhibition. Uh, and I hope to see everybody uh, back here on our next talk, uh, which will be happening very soon. Um, and that's it from me. I, Janice, would you like to say anything? Yes, um, I hope you all enjoyed that. Now, actually, th listening to Chris's talk reminds me that um, the year before last, I think, Shukin was on at the Louis Vuitton um, Museum, and over 50 of our friends came to the private preview. And uh, later this year, if all goes to plan, the Morozov exhibition will be opening at Louis Vuitton. So I hope you'll all um, come along to that as well. Um, and also, Chris has got an exhibition open later this uh, no, later in May at the National Gallery so I'm sure we'll see him then so thank you very much and I look forward to seeing you at our first event thanks everybody goodbye Bye.